Hello, this is Rohini Gwyn, a member of the American Physician Scientists Association's Virtual Content Committee. Today's episode is on the topic of primary applications. The show notes for this episode will link more information on our panelists, information for double degree applicants, and much more. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Okay, I think we'll get started tonight. So welcome everyone uh, to another one of the APSA interactive sessions of the 2022-2023 academic year. We're pleased to host tonight's session on primary applications with current trainees. And I'd now like to ask our wonderful panelists to go around and introduce themselves. So please include your current institution as well as maybe a couple points that you'd like to highlight about your primary application experience. Um, to be efficient, I'll call on you by name. So first up is Cora. Hi, everyone. My name is Cora Miracle. I currently am at Marshall University School of Medi Medicine, also called Joan C. Edwards School of Medicine. Um, part of my primary education is I took a, a gap year um, between my undergrad and when I applied and got some papers published, which was really helpful. Great, thank you. Next is Alan. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm at the University of Rochester. I'm a G4. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a little far back now for me to remember, but yeah, a bit of a circuitous path. I taught chemistry for a year, traveled, did research. So um, seems like that'll be a theme probably. Great, next up is Daniel Shea. Hi, um, I'm Danielle. I'm currently MS2 at Stony Brook University. Um, I guess one of the unique aspects of my application was I highlighted um, music as being one of my significant experiences um, as something I was pretty involved in in college and it gave me something to talk about in my interviews. Great. Next is Bismarck. Hi, everyone. I'm Bismarck. I'm on M1 from Yale. And um, one thing that I would like to highlight for my application is um, um, because um, I applied during the COVID year, um, so I, I happened to join um, the volunteer vaccination team in Stony Brook. So that was one point that I made sure to highlight in my application. Okay, next is Danielle Sawyer. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Sawyer. I am a... Um, I guess going on fifth year um, MD PhD student at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And um, I guess uh, some key points of my application was that um, I was a first generation college student. So I found the entire process, you know, pretty difficult to navigate. And that's why I love to volunteer for panels and things like this. Um, and I also did, I did research at a community college um, at uh, UC Davis, and um, I also worked as a medical scribe. So. Great, and last but certainly not least, Carrie. Hi, I'm Carrie Jansen. I am an, on the last rotation of my M3 year, actually, at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, I guess something I highlighted in my applications was um, how growing up on a farm influenced my interest in science and medicine. Great. And thank you to the panelists for joining us here this evening. We're grateful that you took the time out of your day to come virtually meet all these uh, prospective students and share your pearls of wisdom to folks thinking about applying and informing them on how to approach their primary application. Um, my name is Rohini Gwyn, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm a first year MD PhD student at Stony Brook University. Joining us in the chat box, who will also be helping us moderate behind the scenes is Min Pham. Uh, for those of you who are going to step away or miss any part of this session, uh, we're just reminding you that it's being recorded. So all the information will be made available to you if you choose to tune in at a later time as well. Um, as the moderator, I'll remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. And we have already received pre-submitted questions during the registration process. We have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes collecting questions live. 
So you can submit the questions in the chat box and we'll um, direct them to the to be answered live as well. I think that's all the announcements that I have for you right now. So thank you again all for being here. And I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. OK, so I kind of divided up questions based on categories that came up most frequently. So just to start off, um, a topic that a lot of applicants are curious about are school lists. So uh, in doing that, how did you identify what programs to apply to? I guess I'll kind of I'll kind of start there. Um, I kind of looked regionally. Um, there is a list on um, AMSA. I can't remember what it's called uh, that organizes you based on your GPA and MCAT and which schools you know you're best um, fitted to. Um, so I kind of looked at that to see where my scores were ranged and where I thought that I would fit. And then I looked geographically and then I went and I looked into their uh, PhD programs website and kind of saw their areas of research to see if the it was interesting in an area that I felt like I would fit in. I think um, I started geographically um, and then kind of went from there on program characteristics. I knew I wanted to be like in kind of broadly the Southeast for family reasons. And so then I kind of drew a map and looked at the programs that were in that area and then um, applied to the ones that seemed like they might be a good fit for me. So I would say I agree with everything everyone else has said thus far. That's basically what I did. Um, I did want to add the perspective um, from like the admissions perspective. Um, I've worked with um, basically on the MD PhD admissions committee here, the MD admissions committee, and I'm part of the executive committee right now for our program. And um, I think mostly um, what a lot of schools are looking for is a good fit as far as research you know, based on what kind of research you're really interested in and the kind of research that is offered at that institution. So I always say, you know, check out like the major, um, you know, major PhD programs that are offered, you know, the major institutions like U of A, for instance, has a, you know, a really great cancer center. We also have a really great like neurology center. So um, I, I think that looking at um, as far as fit for what you want to research and what you ultimately want your career to be in research, I think that that's super important to consider. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, did anyone here apply to a mix of MD and MD PhD programs? If so, why? If not, why did you choose to only apply to MD PhD or DO PhD programs? I think I can start. Um, personally, I think um, I applied to about 25 MD PhD programs and I just threw in one MD program just uh, for the sake of throwing it in. So um, I, I had previously technically applied in the 2021 cycle um, through um, SUNY Downstate's EME program. So I was only restricted to Downstate's program, but then um, I decided um, to defer and then reapply for the next year. And by that time, I had uh, made up my mind that I I only wanted to do an MD PhD program. So that's why I kind of focused all my applications on the MD PhD program. Um, for me, I only applied MD PhD program, but that said, there were some schools where um, they had the option that if you didn't get into MD PhD, um, if you wanted to be considered for MD. Um, so if there's like no extra work involved besides checking that box, then I did it because um, if you're in the MD program, you can apply in the second year, which was what I was thinking um, would be like my backup plan. Um, and in terms of why I didn't like before I applied, I guess I was kind of like teetering between MD or MD PhD. I knew I wanted to do academic medicine, but just like wasn't sure which route. But um, I feel like 
it was better that I made up my mind before I started applying because that way I could really like tailor my application for like one particular program and then all the all your letters of rec are going um they're going to ask you what your what program you're applying to and if you're doing both it becomes kind of tricky I think So I only applied to one MD program. Um, the rest were MD PhD programs. And the only MD program I applied to was sort of a backup, but I was very determined to be an MD PhD. So if I did only get accepted into that MD program, um, they were very close and had a really good graduate school right next door. So I would have done it backwards and just gone to medical school and then hopped over to their graduate school and got my PhD there. Um, so that was my kind of thought process. Great, thank you everyone for chiming in on that question. Um, the next question, again, related to applications in general is from a Texas resident. Um, the question is, what is it like applying for TMDSAS and AMCAS for Texas MSTPs? As I am a Texas resident, but out of state undergrad, am I still considered in state for Texas med schools? I believe your state of residence would be like based on where you're like where you're claimed on taxes, like whether your parents are claiming you, whether you're filing, like what state you're filing them in. Um, if you're at least when I applied, which now was nearly 10 years ago, if you're only applying to MSTPs, you only had to apply via AMCAS, at least as an out non-Texas resident. Um, I'm not sure if that's different if you are a Texas resident, but it's my understanding that if you're claimed on taxes in the state of Texas, you're still a Texas resident. Um, if sort of tangentially related to Texas questions, like I know Texas is one of the schools that a lot of pre-health advising offices like tell you not to apply to if you're not a resident of that state. Um, I found that several, I didn't apply to any California schools, which is another place that people say that about, but that's also something people say about North Carolina and Virginia schools. and. I found that that largely didn't really apply. If you were applying MD PhD, like the, oh, it's impossible to get in if you're not in state is really mostly applies to MD admissions and less so to MD PhD. So if there's a program you really love in one of those, like you have to be a resident state, so you should still apply. Um, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you have strong ties to any community, that it's really easy to convince an admissions committee, even an MD admissions committee, um, that, you know, you would be a good fit for their school. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't consider, you know, if you live there most of your life and then you moved out of state for college, I don't think that that's going to be a significant barrier at all. Great. Um, the next question along the lines of school list is also, did you apply to non-MSTP and MSTP programs? If so, why? If not, why not? So the school that I'm at, it's technically not considered a full-blown MSTP program. Um, it is fully funded, so it is just considered an MD-PhD program, but it still has all the benefits of an MSTP. You still have the full stipend. You still have the tuition waiver. Um, we just technically don't have that full-blown NIH funding, but we still have plenty of funding. Um, so the MSTP versus MD-PhD program didn't matter to me as much. Um, as long as, you know, they had plenty of funding and they were still willing to make sure that um, <clears throat> you had a stipend all the way through. Um, I applied to non-MD, non-MSTP programs, but again, only ones that were fully funded that, um, you know, would have the full benefits that a funded MSTP would. Um, I didn't draw a ton of distinction between the two as long as it was funded and mostly went on like how good of a fit the program was. Okay, so moving on from school list, um, the next section we wanna address are essays. And the most common question we've been getting 
is how do you differentiate between your personal statement and the YMD PhD essay when you're crafting both of them? So there's a huge difference between the two, right? Um, so the why the MD PhD is why you're applying to that program in the first place, where uh, to me, the personal statement is more about getting to know you and your qualities and why you deserve to be in a medical school. So the personal statement is for the medical school admissions, at least for you know the admissions committee that I serve on to kind of get to know you on a personal basis and for your opportunity to stick out. And then the why MD PhD is why do you wanna go through this seven to eight year program? Why is it so important to you to marry the two? Um, why not just be an MD that does research? Um, so to me, they're two very distinctly different essays where one's your time to shine on who you are and um, why medicine and the other times uh, why you have to marry the two. I largely agree. I will say too, it's okay if there's a little bit of overlap. Like for me, I um, I mostly only applied to MD PhD programs, and a lot of the reason I want to be a doctor is the same reason I want to be a physician scientist. It's all related to me. Like I kind of felt like when I was writing them, if they weren't, if I could separate them, then I wasn't sure that this was really what I wanted to do to like do both. So I think it's very okay if you're, um, if you're personal statement talks about wanting to be a physician scientist. Um, and, and then you also have the YMD PhD. I think for mine, like my initial, my personal statement talked a little bit more about kind of the like theoretical ideas of like why I wanted to be a, a physician scientist and how I came to that conclusion. And then the YMD PhD kind of had a little more concrete details about the experiences that like led me to actually apply. I think for me, um, I kept mine very separate. You know, I would like encourage everyone to be really cautious and read the question that they're asking and make sure that you're directly answering that question. And um, the personal statement, you know, question is why do you want to go into medicine? So I think you need to make sure that you're answering that question at the end of the day. And there are many ways I'm sure that you can answer it, but um, really be sure to do to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I tend to not to repeat a lot of what's been said, but if um, your personal statements, why you want to go to med school, your research statements more for the PhD faculty that are going to evaluate your aptitude or competence as a scientist, the YMD PhD is kind of like a love child between the two. Um, and at the same time, I mean, it was relatively short from what I remember. Uh, and so you'll fill it up quickly with buzzwords, like you'll see a lot of people put their bench to bedside and all those fun things. Um, so I think, yeah, it's really just what do you think you're going to get out of the training? Um, and sadly, that might even just be like learning how to really write a grant or things you learn as a scientist or through a PhD training that you won't get as an MD doing research. Um, although having the MD, you'll probably get a grant. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's just exactly what everyone said. Um, but think of it as kind of an overlap between the two. Going off of that, um, how did you all approach the significant research experience essay? So I had a, a pretty large amount of research going into the MD-PhD program. I had about four years. Um, so really what I wanted to hammer home is I had four papers coming out. So I really went into all of the techniques I learned, um, all of the experiments that failed, because really I think one of the things that a lot of committees like to see is that you know that science doesn't work 99% of the time. And you know your papers are made off of that 1% of the time that your experiments work. Um, so really that you know the cycle of, of research. So really I just kind of talked a little bit about like my day-to-day -day in the lab, the techniques that I learned. Um, the hardships that I faced. It wasn't really like an essay, like a paper of like, oh, well, you know, I studied IL-33, which is this type of cytokine. It was more about the techniques and the the day-to-day -day experience. Um, yeah, I think just to come home on what Cora said, um, it is really important that, um, uh, or personally in my case, that I added like the difficulties that I faced um, in my research and why despite all those difficulties, I still decided to pursue uh, an MD-PhD program. And so 
I think that is a salient point that um, applicants will benefit from um, by highlighting. Yeah, to that point, I think I, I felt like I was encouraged to emphasize what Gore was saying about, yes, the things that failed, but also the techniques, almost like I was applying for a job as a tech. What am I capable of? What did I, and what did you specifically do? Like, I mean, you are applying for a job. Um, so there's a lot of like, what did you do? Because sure, I think one, doing both, there's the presumption that you did pre-med. So maybe you weren't as scientifically rigorous as someone who was going through a straight PhD, um, which is obviously, as we're hearing, not always the case, but you know, a lot of people who are pre-med will do a summer of research. Um, and of course you could read papers and understand them, but it's not the same thing saying, I did this method. I like did a hundred different, whatever you do. I mean, I do computational stuff, but whatever it is you did, um, I felt like it was very focused on the methodology um, and your understanding of that methodology, not just, oh yeah, I read a paper and I can recite a pathway. Great. Um, one of our other questions pre-submitted was regarding the 15 activities and the three most significant experiences. So how did you go about prioritizing what you included and how did you highlight research in those? Um, specifically, um, if you did have a lot of research, how did you format publications, posters, presentation, or funding sources? So I applied five years ago, if that shows my age. Um, so I, applying MD-PhD, I made sure that research was one of my top uh, 15. Um, but I also kind of wanted to put some activity that, you know, showed that you're not just a scientist and you're not just, you know, shadowing. Um, I don't remember who said it, but the, the musician, like, I think that's super cool, like that you have a hobby and that you're a human outside of what you do. I think that's like something like that's important to put in your top three. Yeah, I remember when I was um, deciding on my top three. So two of them were research. Um, so one, the research I did at my undergrad and then also did a two year post back. So I highlighted those two experiences. And then the third one, I was really uh, like hesitant at first to put down music. Um, I play the flute and I was like, playing chamber music every semester and I was in orchestra and I really liked it um but I wasn't sure like how that would like if I should like highlight it as a significant experience and what that would like I don't know imply I guess but um but um ended up talking to my pre-med advisor and she said that it's um like when you're thinking about what to choose your, your three significant experiences like think about like what three are like truly most significant to you that like you um like you definitely have to have in your life um so yeah I guess for me one of those experiences was music I guess to to just reiterate they do ask you in the interviews about your top three so if you put something in your top three that you can't talk about and you're not passionate like if I put music like I played the piano in like second grade there's no way that you want to hear me talk about that because I can't so that's kind of more of like a red flag if you put something that you think will draw their interest, but you can't talk about it. If it's something silly, but you're super passionate about it, put it in your top three if it's a good talking point. And definitely keep research in your top three. Like that's like the number one thing for MD PhD applications is your research experience. That doesn't mean you have to have a ton of publications or anything like that, but it should be like a formative part of your application and one of your like impactful experiences. So definitely like put that at the top. And then I agree about like just being like who you are, whether it's a hobby or like a club, some random like scuba diving club you started or something like put what you're passionate about. Um, I know that another part of that question was how to format like publications and research. Um, I think it kind of depends if you have a publication that's like coming out, but not actually published. I think you can just like tack it on like in your in your, when you're talking about your research. Um, I guess if you wanted to highlight, you could say that you have a paper in progress, but if you have multiple pub publications, um, I did I, I did have I think I did have a separate 
I don't know, it's been a while, but I think I did have a separate entry for publications and then um and then one for like awards and um awards and presentations and stuff like that. I don't remember exactly what the categories were. <laughs> Great, thank you everyone for chiming in on that as well. Um, I'm seeing some Q&A questions in the chat and thank you to the panelists who've been replying and typing responses back. Um, one of the questions that we did get is about um, the influence of citizenship or international status on the application process. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here on the panel represents that demographic, but if not, if you know of others in your program, and how that experience um, has shaped their application process. If you'd be willing to share, that'd be great. So I'm not, I'm personally from the United States, but my program has a lot of international students. So I could drop my uh, email in the chat and I could definitely get you in contact with, you know, one of our many international students that could tell you how that uh, worked out. Um, if nobody here has has anything. I'm also not an international student, but um, we do have quite a few at Emory. Um, I do know that like sometimes it's a little bit challenging as an international student in the application process just because, um, especially at funded MSTPs, like with the NIH grant, that funding is restricted to US citizens and green card holders. Um, and so sometimes programs only have like a certain number of slots that they can use for international students. And it, that also requires that the program have additional institutional funding outside their MSTP grant. Um, and so um, it like definitely asking anyone that you can find a connection to that is international, how they approached it. Um, to find out like which programs were most friendly to it. I know like at Emory, we really welcome international students. Um, um, and so trying to find the programs that are particularly friendly to it and that are known to have funding outside of the NIH grants um, so that they can host you for the duration of the program is really important. Great, thank you everyone. Um, just circling back a bit to the um, questions on reporting funding sources. Um, we got a question in the chat asking if um, you would count paid research experiences like summer stipends and things like that as, and if you would report those as awards that you have earned. I tread carefully with how much I stretch those kind of things out. Um, but that's just me, um, because there's a lot of other things that are probably more interesting and important than you saying, well, I got this stipend, I did this research. It seems like you're stretching one experience through a, a, a period of time, which maybe that's just me. Um, but if you could fill that space with something else, like a club that you did, I think that that would, would shine a lot more and then keep that, you know, I got a grant. This was my research experience. I got this publication. I got this grant. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. I largely agree. I would say, you know, for me, like one of my summer experiences, like I put as a research experience and then I was like in a specifically like funded and awarded spot within that program. And I did list that as an award because it was like a separate thing from the rest of the program. Um, and so it kind of got listed in both places in that way, but it was sort of a separate thing. So I, I agree with Cora, I wouldn't like stretch things too thin, but if there is something special about some aspect of it, I think it's okay to separate it. Like for me, like the award that I had for that program was like named after um, a grateful patient. And there was like a lot of story behind like that thing. And so it was important and something that I liked talking about. Um, and so just consider like, what it tells about you and what you would talk about in an interview um, when you're thinking about what to list on there. Yeah, I would echo those statements. I think it kind of depends on the award. Like, like I know a lot of the summer like programs, um, they have a stipend award attached to it. Um, and maybe that's not as significant as if you applied for like, like, um, one of like the national fellowships that fund your summer research with the PI that you're with. Or um, I know in my senior year, I did an off-campus 
senior thesis and um so I had to take the train I went to school in Philly so, um I went to Bryn Mawr, but I had to take the train to Philly like three times a week and um so transportation wasn't covered so I went through the dean's office and it was like a whole thing to try to get a um travel award for that and so I did include that as well and I know that in one of my interviews it actually I think it was the one at Stony Brook um it came up and they actually mentioned it how it um it showed like initiative and in applying for funding to in order to do research um which is what you're going to be doing in the future so I think it could um yeah it could work out I just wanted to add to that. Um, I agree in general, and I've seen, um, I think a lot of really good applications use the experiences space um, in a really kind of cool way where they condense experiences um, that might not be necessarily as important, but you want to talk about like job, like, you know, paid experiences. I've seen people list like three or four jobs. The same with shadowing, like if you shadowed multiple physicians and you just want to include like 10 hours in cardiology with Dr. So-and-so and 20 hours in primary care with Dr. So-and-so. And um, the same with awards. Like if you had a few, you know, research awards or whatnot, you could list them all under one experience rather than having to separate them out. And I think that gives you a lot more space if you need the space to talk about, you know, other things. So I always recommend that. Awesome. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, questions related to application preparedness um, and more like special cases as well. So I'm going to read this directly, but the question is, I have a lower undergraduate GPA and completed a master's degree through a post back program to raise my academic record. I'm not sure if I should apply to MSTP programs with a 3.4 undergraduate GPA and a 3.8 graduate GPA. Um, what would you advise? Um, if it were me, I would say if you really want a career as a physician scientist and you can't achieve that career um, by getting an MD or a PhD alone, so like this is the sole path for you to achieve your goals, then I think you should absolutely apply. Um, I don't think, um, you know, GPA plays a massive role. I mean, it does in the sense like we want to know that you're going to pass your board exam um, and you're going to do okay graduate courses. But aside from that, it doesn't, you know, it's not, there's so many more important things um, that go into your application that I wouldn't let that deter you from applying. Um, yeah, so to add to what Danielle said, I think um, the application pro process um, as a whole is a story, right? So um, we are this we are trying to describe ourselves um, to an admissions committee to let them know why we deserve a spot in their program. And so, in, from your point of view, um, from a GP of three point four to a GP of three point eight, so there is a significant increase there. And um, if you can find a way to include in your application the progress that you've made um, through that master's program I think is going to go a long way to help you in your application process. I personally would not focus as much on your GPA. Um, GPA is one factor and most places are holistic especially for an MD PhD at least for our program they'll look at your GPA but that what they want to care about is how much research have you done? And my specific institution will not accept somebody that does not have a paper. Um, so if you're not on a paper, if you're, you don't have to be first author, but if you're not on any type of paper, then we don't particularly look at that. And we look at that more strongly than we look at GPA, but that's my specific institution. Um, I can't speak for other MD PhD programs. I think for ours, we're a little bit less specific on the publications, but um, more just like that your your research experience overall, um, even if it's like a presentation you gave at a conference, even if that conference is something local to your um, your undergrad institution or something like that, and not a big international conference, that's fine. Um, the most important thing is like the the strength of your research experience and 
and sort of the depth of it and your ability to talk about it in a way that communicates that you were driving the research forward, that you weren't just like a tech in the lab that just did experiments that were handed to you, that you were actually thinking about why you were doing what you were doing and what next experiments would be and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that really can make up for like maybe lower stats than you might prefer to have, or then even some like pre-health advisors might tell you you need to have. In my experience, a lot of pre-health advisors are really helpful and knowledgeable, but much more so about MD or DO admissions and not the dual degree admissions, um, because there is a lot of nuance to it. And there's a lot less emphasis on the stats in my experience, at least at our program. It's kind of like, you know, as long as you're not totally like like way off the charts in kind of a less than positive way, um, which is like not the numbers that we're talking about here, then that becomes a much, much less important factor than things like your research experience, your letters of recommendation, et cetera. I think I guess mainly what the big, I guess to me, red flag would be as an MD PhD applicant would be like, oh, I did lab with my classes, like chemistry, I did chemistry lab, organic, I did organic lab, so I have research experience. Um, and we have seen applicants that way, but if you haven't presented a poster and you haven't been to conferences and you haven't been on a project and you haven't been active in forming a hypothesis and all of that, then to me, that's more, that's more important than um, publications. Um, but again, my program thinks publications are important. And I felt personally like they were really important and they made my PhD life a lot easier because um, I already know how to write papers going in. Um, which made my life really nice. But my program also expects you to do your PhD in three years. So the whole program is seven years. So having that experience really just kind of fast tracks the whole thing. I would agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, it's really important to have, I call it ownership of, of a project where you are kind of person, you know, troubleshooting and, and leading this, you know, answering this one question. And it might not, it probably won't at an undergraduate level contribute to an entire first author publication where you have multiple figures you've contributed to. In my mind, at least, um, I think a realistic goal is to aim to contribute to one figure in someone's paper, maybe a few figures in multiple people's papers, depending on how much time you spend in their research lab. And then you know, like um, Cora said, I think it's great advice to travel to conferences. It's something I wish that I had known, um, especially given that there's a lot of funding and whatnot out there to help you, you know, afford to travel. Um, so I think that that's a fantastic way to, uh, you know, have ownership of a part of a project and then be able to present your scientific findings. Um, I think it's great. Um, and oh, sorry. Um, from my interview experience, um, I think in general, a lot of um, institutions are really, really good at determining whether or not um, uh, you had significant research experience and the contribution that you made to the paper was just at the surface level or at the deep level. So no matter the situation in which you are in, whether or not you ended, ended up publishing a paper, or not as long as you can demonstrate um, how significant your research experience was, I think um, it can permeate um, throughout the interview process and you can leave a lot of impacts with the people who are making the decisions. Can I make a general comment? Okay. So a lot of what I'm hearing, and I think is, is like I like to say when I do these, is everyone's application is their own just like everyone's PhD is gonna be their own. And so I think sincerity goes a long way. And my devil's advocate is you can't necessarily undo your past. So there's people you'll meet and it's happened in my program that maybe they don't finish. They go halfway through and their PI goes to another institution and they decide to master out or their PI is kind of a jerk and they decide to switch labs and they do you know, a seven year PhD when they thought they were gonna do a three year one. So similarly, that might happen in undergrad and maybe, yeah, your PI left or they were actually a really bad mentor, um, but that's still part of the training and research process. And so it doesn't mean your two years were wasted and you shouldn't include that or feel bad if you feel like this is the path for you. Um, it's a training program and there are a good amount of institutions that are not laxed, but understanding of 
you're training and you don't have all the answers and you're there and by the end and even then you'll still have to go to residency and postdoc and everything so i think you can't under your past if that was your experience and it was quote unquote you know, subpar there's no publication um it was less than ideal but you still love research that's also a good sign in and of itself um you went through the ringer and you're still excited to do it so yeah just your story is your own Great, thank you for sharing everyone. Um, the next question is, what kind of advice would you give to a non-trad college graduate that wishes to pursue an MD, PhD, but hasn't been involved in research for a long period of time? How long is long? And how significant was the <laughs> research before the long hiatus, I guess? Unfortunately, it is not specified in this question. I mean, if you took a serious break, you know, I, I don't see a problem with it as long as you're still passionate about research. I mean, sometimes you have to take breaks from things you love to figure out you love them. Um, so I, I don't see it as bad if you have that significant portion of research. I mean, it's like riding a bike. You know, I hadn't done a Western in two years and then I joined my PhD and here they are. So I think if it's significant in that, you know, period of time and everything that we've already encompassed, then I, I don't, I personally don't see a problem with it. And I don't think the admissions committee at my school would, but. Yeah, yeah, just to add on, so, oh, sorry, Alan, just quickly, the, I think the participant in the chat said uh, three years off, if that gives a better time frame for tailoring your response. Well, I would just say real quick, I would even invert it and in that I knew a lot of people kind of did the opposite, it sounds like, where say they were a lab tech or worked in industry for several years. And so we're very far away from an academic uh, setting in terms of studying for med school. And that was a very big transition for them or weren't doing any shadowing or clinical exposure whatsoever. It was pure science. Um, and nobody really bad in an eye. It's sort of, you know, and yeah, it, it's hard, just the same way it's going to be hard to go back to third year, which two people here can speak to, but it all works out. Um, so I think if, yeah, exactly what was said, as long as that passion's there, it seems to work out in both directions. So if anyone has that concern too, where they've been working in industry or, you know, as a, you know, lab tech or something, then you'll probably also get into an MD-PhD. Yeah, I would say like the most important thing throughout this whole process is just like to tell your story. So whether you took time off because of something personal or something unexpected that comes up, I'm sure um, you can explain that to programs. If it's something that you think like uh, gives you a unique perspective, um, you can also highlight that in your application. Um, I mean, the three years weren't like missing from your life, like you just weren't doing research. So um, there's still three years that shape who you are and why you want to do this. Great, um, we're gonna transition to some more general questions and general advising. Um, so one of our pre-submitted questions reads as, what are the critical factors to be competitive for an MD-PhD program? Uh, I'll start with one. Um, I think, uh, research mentors who can speak to your research potential and your ability to succeed as a physician scientist, um, if they can get that across in their letters or back. And so I kind of help with the admissions committee. Obviously I can't accept anybody, but I help with the admissions for my school. And at least some of the main things that my school looks for is the significant research experience, um, which we have all really harped on. Um, and really the love and commitment and then the tenacity to be able to do it, um, because I guess everybody here can speak. This is a long program and a long road, and we have had people in our program go to enter the PhD and be like, you know what? Nope, I'm just going to do my MD, and then the program loses a lot of funding, so they want to make sure that you are committed to this seven to eight years, and you're not going to just choose one or the other. I think um, 
I think at least for our program, uh, there's kind of the two sides of it. The MD PhD admissions, you have to get accepted by them. And then you also have to get accepted into the, the medical admissions um, program. So you could be accepted into one if you're a great research applicant, not accepted into the medical school if you don't have kind of like bare minimum. And yes, they make a lot of exceptions, but um, I would say it's really hard um, when people have like zero clinical experience or zero volunteer experience. Um, I think that's that's pretty hard to overcome. Um, we understand that you're going to spend most of your time doing research, and I think that's great. But I think, you know, trying to, um, you know, make sure that you're kind of, you have a well-rounded application, I think is really important. Um, also, I know um, it's, there's kind of like a time out there um, that, you know, they want you to essentially have done research for about two years ish is kind of what they consider competitive, but I always say that that can be so variable and I'm actually working to change that into like an hour, a number of hours, because, you know, two years of research, one, one day a week as an undergrad is very different from two years of research after you graduate. So, um, I think that, um, you know, they really are looking for that significant experience. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and then finally, I think fit is fit with the program is really important. Um, how, uh, you know, essentially how well you fit with, like, how likely are you to, to go across the country to that program or across the state or wherever that program is located. That's something that we have recently been kind of integrating into our decision making is, you know, how excited is this person about our program and, and why are they telling us that, you know, this would be a good fit for them and does that, you know, kind of line up and make sense for us. That's actually like a really, a really, really good point because Mar at least my program is Marshall. Um, if you have the scores and the research experience, but you don't even know the director's name or they can tell that you did not look at the website before the interview, they're not going to take you. If they can tell that you're just applying to MD PhD programs to get the letters behind your name and don't care to, you know, look up the experiences and make sure that you fit, it's a little bit of a red flag to them. This is not direct, well, kind of, but related, sort of, and more often than not, a lot of people apply to, like, work with one person um, at an institution. I know someone, it worked out for them, their undergrad mentor said, if you go here, work with this person through your PhD, and, you know, it was beautiful, but that could also be bad, but within that same vein, more often than not, like, while one program might have many good departments, you're typically going for a particular couple PIs or department, like, Fine, we can do immunology too, but like Rochester is a really good optics program. Um, so people who are interested in imaging, whether it's two photon or something else, typically come here and even straight PhDs because they, you know, they're interested in optics, similarly in neuroscience. So I think just in that vein, really know at least the department and a couple of people in there that you're interested in and have a couple backups. Um, a lot can change. Uh, someone, one of my friends started his PhD with someone and she moved not even that far. She moved to Cornell, so from Rochester to Ithaca, but he didn't want to go with her. So those are going to happen. So keep those things in mind and know a few names of people you'd want to work with. Um, yeah. Great. You don't, you don't have to do this, but at least one of the tips for my interviews is I read a couple abstracts of some of the PhDs um, mentors so that I knew like their specific projects. So when they asked me, you know, who are you interested in? I could say, oh, well, you know, Dr. Salisbury does, you know, triple negative breast cancer and the mTOR pathway. And they're like, she actually read something, you know, like just showing the interest is good. I also will say that, you know, when you get to the stage of interviewing, the people that, um, you know, interview you oftentimes are um, kind of aligned, or at least we try to align them um, to be within, you know, a field that you might be interested in or have indicated you're interested in um, so that that can be a really good fit. So I think, um, you know, definitely doing your homework and research on the people that you are going to be interviewing with is super important in that sense as well. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. 
Um, what is one piece of advice you wish you knew before you entered your application cycle? Your application is yours and yours alone. And you should never feel like you have to like fit in anyone else's boxes. Like do what you're most, most passionate about and then like let your application tell the story of what you did and why you did it. Um, you know, a little bit backing up from the application, like I, one of my majors in undergrad was biology. I really wanted to be a primarily biology major because that's I wanted to do the research program my school had in the biology major and like go that route towards MD PhD. And I almost didn't do it because I felt a lot of pressure to, to not like be a typical biology major and pre-med applicant, but it was what I really wanted to do. And so it was the right thing for me. And so, um, do what you're passionate about and then the, and then really focus on making your application tell that story of who you are and why you want to do what you um are trying like are applying to do you don't don't try to like make it sound like you think anyone wants to hear just really tell your story um and that's what comes across like most genuine and most impactful and most like exciting and inspiring when we interview candidates um we can tell that they're really passionate and they're eager to tell us their story about why they want to be a physician scientist i'd just like to add to that i think i got a lot of really crappy advice from other pre-meds who were just stressed out and applying um you know to programs and they had in their minds you know like this is like how they do it and this is what happens and if I don't do it this exact way it's not going to work out so I would say um especially when you're applying and um, recognize that about 90 percent of the pieces of advice that you're going to get probably won't apply to you and your unique circumstances and your unique path to um you know going into an MD or an MD PhD program um and you know everyone wants to tell you, you know, I did it this way, so you you should do it this way because that's how I did it and I was successful. But there are so many, so many completely different paths and ways to um, all get to the same end, end point um, and to be accepted into a program. So really have that filter on when you're listening to anyone, um, you know, kind of give advice and just say, you know, is this relevant for me? And if it, if it doesn't feel like it is, then it probably isn't. And just, I would say, disregard that advice, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, kind of relatedly, um, not necessarily advice, but a trend and it might go without saying, there's a lot of types of research and there is a conventional historical perception of what an MS, MD, PhD physician scientist is in terms of what lab uh, you know, bench work, but particularly there's a few of my institution, but there are people who do their PhD in epidemiology. Um, people do, you know, biophysics and like protein modeling, um, who never pick up a pipette and that's fine. I do MRI computational work. So I think you'll find your fit, find your path that goes in terms of, you know, similarly, there are people who end up doing surgery for residency after an MD PhD, and that's conventionally or historically not associated with the you know, physician scientist career. And so I think all throughout, um, yeah, just integrity, sincerity, and, uh, you know, if finding your, your path um, and not conforming, if you're not going to be happy for that time. So, yeah. Um, I, and I think um, we, we might have all heard this advice before, but I can't stress how important it is to apply as early as possible um, because it really does make a difference. Um, looking back at my application cycle, um, I think I initially submitted about 20 applications and later down the line, I, I added about eight schools and I never um, heard from any of those eight schools. So um, looking back, I wish I had apply to um, all of the schools at the same time, because it truly does make a difference. I couldn't agree more. Getting your applications in on time is so, so important, whether it's MD, PhD, MD, you know, like you, you're only, you have nothing to lose by submitting like on time slash at the very beginning. And you only like, you only have things to gain and you only have things to lose if you wait too long. Because then you're going to be still working on primary applications, then comes the deluge of secondary applications, and it kind of snowballs and gets away from you. So, like, 
plan out your like summer and fall, make sure you have time to dedicate to these things. You can really get in at the beginning because interviews, a lot of programs are offered kind of on a rolling basis. And you're just working from a smaller pool of inter available interview spots if they're not even seeing your primary application until later in the year. I guess a piece of my advice would be to stay off student doctor network. <laughs> I, you know, that thing always gave me crippling anxiety. Um, that's what I would tell my past self is to stay off of that. Um, and really just echoing what everybody else said is your experience is not you know, the same. So if I told you my experience and said, this is how I got MD, PhD, you know, don't listen to other people, you know, take everybody's advice with a grain of salt, you know, like uh, Danielle said, um, because my MD, PhD experience is not the same as, you know, everybody else in my cohort. Um, so really just have faith in yourself. And a lot of the interview process is about selling yourself and having a humble type of confidence. Um, but really just stay off of student doctor network for your insanity. I know we're running really close to time. So if anyone on this panel wants to say any last closing words, feel free to do that now. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think we also don't have a lot of questions left in the Q&A box. Um, so thank you to all the panelists who've been so diligently typing away responses as well. Okay, if no one else has anything to add, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here tonight for the session on the primary applications. Um, I want to thank our panelists for their time, the participants, which is all of you who've made this session very interactive, and also so many people who are part of the APSA team. So this includes and is not limited to the Diversity Ad Hoc Committee, the Public Relations Committee, the Partnerships Committee, and APSA leadership at large. Um, they all put in um, a lot of effort to organize these sessions. And they also work to make sure that these sessions are well advertised to everyone, including underrepresented in medicine students as well. Um, our next interactive session is scheduled for May 18th, and it'll be a little different this time. It'll be focused on the F30 applications. So it'll be a good opportunity for current trainees, as well as um, prospective applicants who also want to learn about what grant writing looks like in the long run. Um, the registration page will be on our website and I will also include it in a follow-up email after this session. So please also stay tuned via social media and look out for further emails to register for the upcoming events. Thank you, everyone. Rohini, is there a way to give our emails for anybody that has any extra questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can drop it in the chat here, but I also have it on the uh, the bios document that you all filled out. Um, if I have your permission, I'm happy to email it out to all the registrants. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Yeah, please feel free to send my email. Thank you. Yeah, sure.